Hello, hello. My name is Jeremiah Hedden. I wanted to say thank you to everyone who's made the time to join us for the second part of our series uh, of fellows telling their story from cohort two of their fellowship experience. Um, to give us a quick agenda of what we're going to be covering today. Oh, we're going to start with a welcome, uh, do some brief introductions and a brief overview of the fellowship before we dive into our speakers today. Um, our speakers are Kayla Williams, Matthew Lindsley, Levada Owens-White, and Christy Haas Howard. So you all are in for a great uh, session. Uh, I'd like to just take a second just right now to introduce the staff on the call. Um, and so let's go ahead and start with Hannah, you want to jump in first, introduce yourself. Hey, everyone. I am Hannah Noel Bouchard, and I am the nurse operations coordinator here with the Alliance of Nurses for Healthy Environments. You'll hear us call it Annie. Um, I actually participated in the very first cohort of this fellowship, and I had such a great experience, and I've been connected with Annie since, came on board in 2020 and have loved it um, since then. And so I'm really excited to hear about these fellows work. I'll turn it over to Kara. Hi everyone, I am Kara Cook. I'm the Director of Programs with Annie. So excited to be here with you all. And as I said, or maybe did not say, my name is Jeremiah Hedden and I'm the Fellowship Coordinator. So it's my job at Annie to look over all the applications, plan out the, the, the webinars, support fellows in finding their community-based organizations and so forth. Uh, and so I get the lovely pleasure of introducing all of our fellows today. But before I jump into all the introductions, uh, I wanna quickly go back to the slides and just talk a little bit about the, the program itself. Let's get share. So what is the Annie Fellowship? Well, in 2019, the Alliance of Nurses for Healthy Environments launched the first of its kind environmental health nurse fellowship program to train nurses to work with communities in tackling serious environmental health issues with an emphasis on climate health and equity. And so through this program, fellows conduct projects in partnership with the CBO to address a community identified environmental health concern aimed at promoting health equity and building climate resilience. And so what you all are going to hear about this call is what that experience was like working with a community-based organization from the fellow's point of view, from their own uh, story. And so I would like to go with our very first fellow speaker, which is, uh, uh, we'll also discuss a little bit more uh, near the end of all the presentations in regards to what else is involved in the program. Uh, as the fellows are speaking, I highly encourage folks to ask questions in the chat, um, but we will answer all the questions at the very end. And the reason for this is we wanna make sure that each presenter gets their allotted time to present. And then when we get to the Q&A portion of the program, we can just scroll up the chat and answer them right down uh, the line. Because uh, we should have some time at the end for, to answer all the questions, but I don't want us to run out of time in terms of presenters because we got too caught up. Uh, and there's always a chance that we'll end up answering the question organically. And so first, let's go with Kayla Williams. So Kayla joined the nursing profession in 2019 and currently works at the University of Kansas School of Nursing. She is an Eco America Climate for Health ambassador and leads the school's climate justice and planetary health work group. With her guidance, uh, the University of Kansas School of Nursing became an early member of the Nurses Climate Challenge School of Nursing Commitment to educate nurses about the health impacts of climate change. Kayla is a member of the Professional Advisory Board for the Resilient Activists, a nonprofit providing mental health support and community building for environmental activists. As an Annie Fellow, Kayla has partnered with Clean Air Now, a community-based organization working to advance health equity in the Kansas City region and beyond. Prior to becoming a nurse, 
Kayla served for over a decade as a veterinary technician. She is a beekeeper, tree steward, and community garden leader. Through these experiences, she knows that ec ecological solutions must be species spanning and center around human stewardship of the earth. So Kayla, go ahead and take it away. Thank you, Jeremiah. I'm delighted to kick us off. I'm gonna share my slides here with you. Um, okay, there we are. So yes, welcome everyone. Um, my name is Kayla Williams and I'm in the Kansas City, Missouri region. Um, I, I cross the border between Kansas City, Missouri and Kansas City, Kansas. Um, I started working with the uh, community-based organization called Clean Air Now. And they are a climate environmental justice organization in Kansas City. They take action to bring systemic change in industry and government policies and practices to protect health and dismantle environmental racism and inequities that perpetuate the unequal distribution of en environmental hazards in fence line communities. Um, they've been in operation for a few years now. One benefit to working with them is that because of my interest in environmental health, I had, I had already identified um, them as active participants in my own community and had been attending their meetings and talking with them for about 10 months prior to applying for the fellowship. Um, I also had the benefit of one of their co-executive directors is a woman named Athena Smena, and she was in the first cohort of the Annie Fellowship, and through her participation in the mm -hmm. fellowship actually um, became the co-executive director of this organization. So I just want to mention that up front because sometimes this, this uh, fellowship has resulted in folks having new opportunities for employment in the environmental health sector. The community that they serve is a small neighborhood in the Kansas City, Kansas area that's called the Argentine and Armordale neighborhood. Um, I just wanna share a few details from the climate and economic justice screening tool about this neighborhood. They're in the 96th percentile of low income. They have the highest energy, some of the highest energy costs of the region, 95th percentile, 88th percentile in asthma, and they have our 93rd percentile with low life expectancy. In fact, in this area, for some of the folks who live in this neighborhood, the lifespan between their zip code and the neighboring zip code is 22 years shorter. Um, they are considered a historically underinvested neighborhood and they have are in the 99th percentile proximity to risk management facility, which means that they are very, they're near many, many uh, forms of industry that are required to have a risk management plan. Um, and they are also, um, many of the residents there are from um, Hispanic backgrounds, and so they have 97th percentile in linguistic isolation. You will learn about how to use this climate and economic justice tool during the fellowship if you decide to participate. It's a great resource. You'll, you'll reference it many times as you go through your program. I also like to share a picture of the neighborhood because I think a picture uh, speaks a thousand words. So Armordale here is outlined in the red square. And if you look, they are surrounded by three interstate highways. They are at the conjunction of two uh, major, the Kansas and Missouri River in our area. But you'll also see just from a first pass that this neighborhood is surrounded by concrete, except for the little group of trees in the, in the middle of the neighborhood. Um, they're not around a lot of green spaces, whereas if you look at the surrounding areas outside, um, you see a lot more trees and you see a lot more green spaces and not as much of the the concrete and highway systems that um, interface with this neighborhood. So I met with our group and we, and we decided that we were going to figure out what projects they were already working on that they maybe just hadn't had time to get to and see if that would be something we could develop. They came up with three different ideas and we chose to go forward with developing an environmental health action plan. The project consisted of completing an assessment with the neighborhood. Uh, there's a group in the neighborhood called Vecinos in KC, 
they've been working closely with Clean Air Now. I met with that organization several times to discuss what they'd like to see in the Environmental Health Action Plan. We sent out a survey. Partnering closely with that neighborhood organization was important because to complete the survey, they were often the folks who would go door to door, knock on the door and talk to their neighbors and say, hey, we really want your input. Can you fill out the survey? Um, we got the survey results together and we evaluated them. The action plan is intended to be a hyper local tool for community members to take the lead in taking action to protect their health from the environmental hazards in the surrounding areas and to hold the industries accountable for their pollution. So we developed the survey, collected responses, analyzed the results. From those results, we identified key topics that the neighborhood felt they needed, the neighbors felt they needed to learn more about. And we be began mapping those topics to a set of environmental health literacy skills that I, I found in the literature review. And then the neighbors also collected testimonials about what it was like to live near these industries. They're near recycling facilities that are crushing metal. They're near uh, shipping plants where trucks are idling and emitting diesel fuel. They're near um, some, some flood risks. So they have many, many environmental health risks there in their area. And the EPA is managing some of that, but the issue with the EPA is that they are not responsible for cumulative impacts. So maybe one of these industries is in compliance, but that doesn't account for many industries in one specific area. Our next steps, we're moving into the second phase. So the fellowship has completed, but I'll be continuing to work with the, the community-based organization to uh, write on each topic, review with the community members, and then seek funding for the project going forward. It will be available for print and online, and we'll use a QR code to collect feedback so that we can do ongoing improvement of the action plan. It's expected to be ready at the end of this summer. So lessons learned. Um, these projects move at the speed of community, and they move at the speed of trust. So it's really important to when you're approaching a community and you wanna work with them and you wanna help them, that you're humble, that you're, you're listening to their needs first and putting their needs above your own. Um, you can, could get really caught up in, I really just need to finish this project and I really just wanna have this data. And that would just be the wrong way to go about it because hopefully you're developing a relationship that will last over many, many years. Be curious, be interested in what is what you may not know and what they may have to tell you be consistent. If they have a meeting on Friday evening, that may not be the best time for you, but often I had to go because that was the best time for them. That was when they met. And so there were times where at 8 p.m. I would go to the meeting. I just tried to show up as many times as I could, even if there wasn't much that I could do, to let them know that I was going to continue to show up for them and continue to listen to them. Be flexible. Our timeline has changed many times throughout this project. Um, and that's just because they are very busy as activists. So uh, we, you know, I've had to change meetings many times. That's okay. That's going to happen. Be trustworthy um, and be courageous. You know, when when I started this, I was like, who am I to come into these communities and tell them that I want to help them or that I know anything? But really, um, having the courage to show up and just say, you know, I'm here to learn along with you. I'm here to help you. And um, that that takes some bravery and you might have to manage yourself. We talked in our cohort several times about imposter syndrome. Mm -hmm. And you may not be the expert, but you are the person who's showing up and that counts for something. So that uh, completes my presentation and I will pass it on to the next person. Um, can we show some love in the chat uh, to Kayla? Reactions, if you know how to use Zoom. Fantastic uh, presentation um, and lessons learned. I completely agree. Um, and that's only the first presenter. So we, we've got <laughs> more folks for you all to hear from. And I'll go ahead and just slide myself out of the way and get into and do, introducing our next 
presenter. Give me one second to get the slide up. So next up we have Matthew Lindsley, who is a commissioned corpse officer in the United States Public Health Service at the National Institutes of Health, where he works with brain and spine tumor patients on clinical trials. He began his nursing career as a new grad in the Peruvian Andes as a Peace Corps volunteer working out of a village health post. Lindsay is pursuing a, a doctor PH, a doctors in public health, part-time at the John Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health with a focus on food systems and the Department of Environmental Health and Engineering. Ooh. In 2012, he began producing food in Hanover, Pennsylvania on Hobart Farm, where he has found the intersection of agriculture and public health um, as intricately linked in multiple ways. Recognizing that local sustainable food systems are more resilient and mitigate climate change, he seeks pragmatic solutions across sectors in his roles as a nurse, a farmer, and an officer. So I will pass it off to you, Matt. Hey, thank you, Jeremiah. That was great. Let me share my screen here. Right. Okay. Everyone see this? Yep. Good. Okay. Yeah. So as Jeremiah said, I'm a nurse. I have been a nurse since 2005. I'm also a farmer since 2019 when my partner and I bought a farm in Pennsylvania. And more recently, the past four years, I've been working at NIH as a commission core officer. So these three seemingly different roles uh, have all been combined into one amazing role for this fellowship. And for me, um, also as a student, I was drawn to the opportunity to be able to get more community-based farming, agriculture, food system, environmental health, climate change work um, in the Maryland or Pennsylvania area, uh, because for many years I had just worked on my farm. So I partnered with a group that I learned about a long time ago, more than 15 years ago, but had fallen off my radar. And they are called PASA, Sustainable Agriculture. They've been around for 30 years. And they are a group of farmers and food system workers who are dedicated to organizing trainings and performing research. And they work to provide technical assistance and improve the equity and resilience of our food system in the state of Pennsylvania. Um, it was important for me to find an organization that allowed me to do remote work. That was one of my kind of items that I wanted to check the box on because I knew that with my busy schedule, it'd be hard for me to physically get to evening meetings or weekend meetings. Um, as many of you, I'm sure, have a lot on your plate. I wanted this to be able to work and volunteer my services, but also be able to do it on my time selfishly. <laughs> Um, and PASO was wonderful for that because their employees are remote as well. So what did I do with PASA? Well, I first was introduced to a food shed mapping project uh, with a staff member named Tabitha, who described that for those that don't, aren't familiar with food shed maps, um, think of a Google map for uh, the community where farms and uh, agricultural industry are available. You can search, like in this example here, you could search for strawberries and all the farms that sell strawberries and um, that specific season of when strawberries are ready. Um, you could locate those farms, shop online. But we decided, and I, I knew Tabitha and, and Pasa wanted something better than just a, a consumer map that would connect the organizations, the, the farms to the, to the public, um, because we know in public health, these maps can be used in a better way. So I was tasked with understanding how food shed maps work. And before their map went live to the public, give them some feedback on what ideas I had. And in fact, they had never worked with a public health nurse. Or, or nurses in general. So I brought a different lens. Um, some of this work overlapped with my DRPH program coursework. So this, this was exciting. 
So what ended up happening was that work was something I could do independent. In the next following months, I attended their annual conference in February in Lancaster, which was a great in-person opportunity for me to move from all those Zoom calls and doing a lot of emailing to actually see the people and meet, meet those that I was talking to. Um, this was a wonderful four-day conference. I encourage all of you to, to check it out if you're interested in, in food system work. Um, that's me with Emily up in the left-hand corner. I wore my uniform and introduced myself and um, had an opportunity to talk, talk about the public health service because many people thought I was in the Navy. <laughs> um, but at this conference, Emily, another staff member, and I talked about farm to healthcare um, or farm to hospital, uh, this concept of incorporating more local food into our healthcare system, um, either in clinics or hospitals or outpatient centers. Um, but a lot of the food is, is comfort food that is really unhealthy for patients and staff and visitors. So how can we incorporate better healthy food choices into, um, into the hospital? And so she was curious about that work. And so we started talking at the same time I was working on the food shed map work. And this is this was the, the deliverable. This is what I came up with. So I created a poster that I ended up presenting um, at a conference. But the, the poster itself was my work uh, for PASA to be able to look at what was out there and available in the community, you know, out, out in, in the broader world of, of the food system. So I, I examined eight different maps from around the country. I wanted to get good geographic representation. And this poster was meaningful for me because it also meant that I could use this information with their permission to uh, disseminate at a, at a future conference. And it was uh, a good research opportunity for me to give work back to them, but also you know, benefit from this. Um, so my conclusions for PASO were that food shed maps based on my research could be done um, in many different ways, but really they could be used to help reduce food insecurity. And by assisting with planning for these types of programs like farm to institution or food as medicine um, to reduce wasted food and for severe weather or disease or pest management. So imagine a map in which farmers are not just selling to consumers, but they're also identifying challenges. You know, during the COVID pandemic, we had major issues with supply chain. So how about an opportunity for, with the use of maps, for farmers to be able to share resources, um, but also to permit producers and distributors and consumers to connect locally, um, which all benefits the environment. So I, I brought this poster to a conference in Boston in June. It was a great opportunity to network and build my skill set and get comfortable talking about this work. You know, I work at NIH in, in brain and spine tumor research, um, but I'm motivated and, and moving towards food system work. So this was a great way for me to uh, attend this conference. My advisor from Hopkins was also there. So it was an opportunity to um, see her and meet more people and it's just opened up a bigger network. But the work with PASA continued. And as I stated, uh, after talking with Emily, we had more conversations and we created a survey. We realized that it should be IRB approved. And we decided that we would make it simple and short and we would survey healthcare facilities in Pennsylvania. Um, so think of like nursing homes, uh, smaller hospitals, and we've got a list here, um, ambulatory care centers, um, places that, that you would maybe spend a couple days at, um, but still but served food. Um, so we, got, we were exempt from an IRB, um, but that, that was good for me, again, to kind of learn the process. And throughout this summer, as this work still continues, I have 
dovetailed this nicely with my program for my practicum for school. So again, it's, it's doing work that helps an organization, but also that is gonna benefit you so that you're not feeling so spread thin. Um, we have a target to complete this data and have all of our information back um, by October. There have been some setbacks. We hope to present in February at the conference that I attended this year um, in conjunction with a couple other organizations. I also had a great opportunity to pre present a couple education sessions um, to research nurses at NIH, a brief session about Earth Day, and one of the Surgeon General's priorities about youth mental health. So the highlights were meeting all these incredible fellows, uh, interacting with some incredible employees at PASA, and keeping the work going. Because as I move into this work, I know that there's a lot of networking and, and great opportunities for me to keep these relationships going. So in final thoughts, uh, you should apply. It has worked out really well for me. I thought that I didn't have the time or energy to be able to dedicate myself fully to this, that's my timer, to this uh, opportunity, but it was well worth it. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Let's show Matt some love as well uh, in the comments and reactions. Um, I love being a part of this conversation because now I just found out that so far of the two presenters, they're still going to be working with their community-based organizations. And while that is not a requirement of the fellowship, we encourage it because again, you you just built this relationship, why not? Um, and so that is that is awesome news to hear. Uh, let's go ahead and introduce our next speaker, pulling up the slides now. Give me one second. Oh, you know what? I'll just read the, oh, <laughs> okay, cool. Slideshow open, share my screen. All right, bam, and it should be working. Perfect. All right, so Levita Owens White is our next speaker. Uh, Levita is a faith community nurse serving the Ninth Ward Interfaith Clergy Coalition in the city of Wilmington, uh, Delaware, and the Delaware Region Health Ministries Network as coordinator for con Congregational Health Ministries. Uh, Ms. Owens White has over 50 years of nursing experience in acute long-term rehabilitation and community health. Uh, Owens White retired in 2010 and currently serves as a volunteer consultant, assisting congregations, synagogues, mosques, and temples in establishing wellness models of health, uh, civic associations, and developing health committees, and as a liaison between community based agencies and organizations providing health and educational practices. Prior to retiring, she served as a faculty educator for the International Parish. Nurse Resource Center located in Memphis, Tennessee, providing instruction for the foundations of faith community nursing core curriculum for registered nurses and congregational health ministries. Her current interest is in nursing research, exploring a collaborative partnership of community and faith-based organizations in addressing poverty and environmental climate justice. She serves in the Delaware Community Translation Research a cell community advisory council to provide help in overcoming existing barriers, such as lack of trust and inclusion, and reaching the community to become more engaged in solving problems of interest in the community. She is a member of the American Nurses Association and the Delaware Nurses Association. Ms. Owens White is a lifelong member of the NAACP and serves as community chair for the State Conference of Branches Health Committee. So I'll go ahead and pass it off to you, Levita. Thank you so much, Jeremiah. I appreciate your doing the slides for me as well. Uh, as a, a recent graduate of the fellowship, I come to the ANI, uh, the Alliance of Nurses for a Healthy C Community, um, a Healthy Environment. 
out of concern for the health and well being um, as a member of the NAACP. Uh, in 2018, I was invited to take uh, part with their environmental justice uh, committee. So the focus on clean air, safe drinking water, uh, sustainable agricultural practices and food systems were part of our, as well as um, transit, transportation was part of our training that we received as being a part of the commitment of the community. I belong to a frontline community. So I was tremendously uh, in, invested in taking the training and being a part of the uh, ECJ committee. Uh, I am uh, a faith community nurse and as uh, my bio read, I work with uh, congregations uh, to improve the health of their their congregation, making them a healthy co congregation in the community. And hopefully they would in part uh, be, um, be invested in reaching out to the community in which they're established and uh, take some of the training back out into the community. Uh, I started uh, with uh, my community-based organization Back in 2011, uh, as it was interested in environmental justice uh, and uh, being bringing forth Health Alliance along with the environmental to connect our communities and be a voice for the community in which um, we are established. So I was very pleased to become a part of the, a member of the uh, second fellowship that. Um, uh, took place and I'm uh, so excited to be a part of, of this uh, webinar. So we have um, with my community-based organization is called the Delaware Concerned Residents for a Healthy Environment, which uh, started in 2011, uh, initiated in 2011. However, I did not, um, uh, get back, back involved until I joined this, uh, the community-based organization, which had an interest in, in connecting climate and environmental justice, addressing some of the, um, the health disparities that were part of our community. So um, I was charged through this community-based organization uh, with uh, connecting with the many organizations, uh, civic associations that were doing something around um, climate and environmental justice. So uh, my next uh, slide, please. Next slide, please. Uh, was around uh, trying to uh, trying to get the uh, community that this CBO connected with the other organizations that were operating in the, in the state. This is a picture of uh, the group that I initially started with. Of course, um, as time went on, there's many of those had dropped off um, and out of, uh, out of uh, connection with our, our uh, organization, but we, pressed on trying to inform and empower our community to take action to protect the, the rights of all our people in the community with clean air, water, land, and food. So I was uh, once again, um, very excited to be a part of this group. Next slide, please. So in standing against uh, 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 environmental racism and, and trying to uh, provide information to the community. We uh, saw this as part of the mission of, of uh, the organization. Next slide, please. Uh, Delaware um, is a small state and most people will ask me, Delaware? And it is uh, situated between Pennsylvania and uh, Maryland uh, on the I-95 uh, corridor. 
So we all know that where we live, work, and play uh, has a great impact on the health of our community. So uh, we wanted to be able to uh, address throughout not just uh, our counties, but throughout the whole state. Next slide, please. So this is Delaware. And we're composed of three counties, uh, the Wilmington area, the Newcastle County would be the most Northern half of it. Uh, Kent County would be in the middle and Sussex County would be uh, the lower half of, of Delaware connecting with uh, uh, part of Maryland. So we have part of the Eastern shore of Maryland as well. Uh, Wilmington is the most populous uh, of, the, of the three counties. And so a lot of resources are available in, in uh, Wilmington. However, Dover and Sussex counties uh, sometimes uh, lack the resources that is needed for the community to, to thrive. Sussex County is more agricultural, uh, more rural. And so uh, they have to either go to up to um, Dover uh, or a part of uh, Maryland to, for some of their healthcare needs. So next slide, please. So in, in uh, assessing the community, we looked at what uh, the majority of the concerns were across the state. And uh, the majority uh, considered climate change is very important important issue and um, uh, in, in the other uh, counties uh, that were attract, affected by climate change, they uh, felt that um, uh, the sea rise because Del Delaware is the lowest lying uh, state in the United States for uh, sea rise, the level of sea rise. And with the recent climate change and the storms and tornadoes, uh, we have been very much impacted by um, uh, floods uh, that have uh, been, been part of the climate change. Uh, next slide, please. This is a picture of an of, uh, uh, area where uh, we in Newcastle County have been trying to address this portion, if you can see in the background, is the Delaware um, River uh, Bridge that connects New Jersey and uh, Delaware together. And along that coastline of, of, of Delaware, they uh, have an area that we call the Flats. And now there is uh, a company, a film company um, that want to turn this land into some apartments. Next slide, please. Uh, this is the plan that they have for doing rental units on the, on the site. But again, uh, being uh, that we are uh, low-lying uh, uh, coastline here, uh, most of the people in the area that this land affects do not want to see uh, apartment or any development of uh, where people will live to be set, set up there. Next slide, please. So in the lower part of, of uh, Delaware, it would be um, in Sussex County. And there is a plan for a biogas plant to be set up there uh, to um, utilize chicken feed to turn into uh, a product where uh, it would be used for fertilizing. And again, this proposed plant site is in an area of uh, Hispanic and Haitian community uh, that uh, it would affect within a, a mile of, of, of their living and resources. And not to mention that uh, transportation, uh, if the plant goes through, uh, the transportation of, of heavy truck and, and um, coming into the area would adversely affect the, the people that are living around the plant. So Sussex County, um, their community, they uh, the county is approving 
the plant site, but the residents are opposed to it. So we are uh, do have a complaint into the uh, Environment Protection uh, Agency uh, in regards to the adverse effects that this plant would have on the residents in this area. Next slide, please. So addressing the community air monitoring, uh, and this would particularly be uh, pertinent for the biogas plant that would be uh, coming up because they would be em emitting a lot of methane ga gas, uh, which would not only affect the immediate area, but it would affect the rest of, of the state. Uh, you may not know that uh, Delaware is uh, downwind from New York and Pennsylvania and upwind from Maryland. So we get a lot of air pollution uh, that comes from the uh, surrounding uh, states. And not to mention that having uh, methane gas pumped into the air would not be a benefit. So there is a, a community air monitoring network uh, that uh, is part of our Delaware Concerned Residents um, community. And we are recently received uh, from the uh, Inflation Reduction Act, $358,000 to do the air monitoring throughout the state. So uh, this is uh, aligned with uh, our uh, Representative Lisa Blunt Rochester's bill to um, mandate the uh, monitoring in frontline co communities. So we have already received that money and we have uh, residents, not only um, uh, here in Newcastle County, but throughout the state who have agreed to set up air monitoring stations that they will monitor on a regular basis. Um, next slide, please. This is uh, one of the plants uh, that is in um, Newcastle County. It's the uh, Delaware City, city and it, it uh, produces uh, gasoline and uh, other plants that we're pretty much affected by. And so uh, next slide, please. That is another area of concern. So uh, again, we received, uh, I said 365 was $375,000, uh, but this is, uh, we just received that money um, in, in June to start operating um, activities focused on blood lead testing and uh, lead poisoning surveillance and um, linking to other services. Next. Next slide, please. Uh, one of the things that uh, we recently had 50 schools because of COVID, the schools were closed down. And so some of the drinking water that was in their fountains, uh, we found a high lead level. So th th this was uh, particularly important in getting this money to help us monitor as not only the the uh, air quality, but also the water quality. So my CBO had had said uh, because we're spread statewide, that it would be beneficial to the group if we had a directory of of all the environmental groups working in Delaware that are established in J Delaware, so that we might connect in, in uh, some form or fashion with these groups. And uh, that was the task that I, I was charged with to develop a directory. And I found 103 environmental organizations um, in, in Delaware um, and six are uh, open space organizations in, in Delaware. So we're working with the Environmental Justice Community Partnership and it is a consortium of, of community organizations and environmental justice groups uh, to uh, uh, maybe connect uh, resources. And when we're uh, doing um, this complaint that we can have more people 
listed uh, when we approached the EPA about our, um, our concerns. So our community-based uh, organization is affiliate of the Environmental Justice Health Alliance for Chemical Policy Reform, which is uh, a national uh, uh, organization. And uh, it is also a partner of uh, the Climate Energy um, Climate Energy Organization and the Delaware Association for Environmental Education as well. Next slide, please. Vida, thank yes. you so much. I think we reached our time, and so we want to make sure we get some space for Chrissy to speak. Oh, my my phone didn't go off. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's all good. All good. Can we please show some love to Levita in the chat? Some reactions. Uh, as you, some of you may know, Wilmington, Delaware has a lot, a lot of negative health outcomes due to all the, the factories and facilities around it. So there's a lot of really good work that's happening around there. Um, but yes, and as that comes in, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our final presenter before we can start segueing over to the Q&A. And I already see some questions in the chat, so thank you to the folks who've already asked them. If you have any other questions, don't, don't be shy. Feel free to throw them in there. We'll get to them uh, when Christy finishes. So let me get this Sharon. It should be good. Yep, perfect. All right. So Christy Haas Howard is uh, now the program director for health at the National Environmental Education Foundation. We'll let her talk about that in a bit. Uh, Christy oversees the development, execution, and evaluation of health initiatives related to the environment. She collaborates with the conservation and K-12 education teams to identify priority areas of common interest to maximize resources and impact. As an experienced healthcare provider, Christy tracks emerging trends in the health and environmental space, recognizing and amplifying the opportunities to create greater health equity and environmental justice. She has over 17 years experience as a registered nurse in the school setting. She has been an asthma educator certified since 2009 and led various school-based asthma programs at the local and state level. She also worked at the national level to cultivate and increase in school nurses' knowledge and skills related to asthma care. Christy has presented and published on asthma and upstream benefits of addressing environmental exposures and climate change. Her other projects include supporting a pilot air quality sensor network and health literacy project in Denver, Colorado, and implementing an air quality and asthma literacy project as a part of this fellowship, which we'll talk a little bit more about in a bit. Through these professional experiences, she has seen the growing impacts of climate change on the health of children and communities, along with the disparate health outcomes due to systemic racism. Empowered by this knowledge, Christy's personal and professional goals focus on health equity and climate justice. So Christy, go ahead and take it away. Thank you, Jeremiah. Let's see. Can you all see my screen okay? Go. Yep. All right. Well, um, I'm so excited for you all to be here. Thanks for listening to our stories. I am Christy Haas Howard, as Jeremiah said, and um, I'll be sharing with you my experiences and um, in the fellowship. So as an introduction to who I am, um, I was a school nurse for 17 years working at the local and state level in, um, and in that time became asthma educator certified. My three sons have asthma, my husband has asthma. Um, and so as I did more and more work in asthma, I, I learned more and more about upstream impacts and what causes and triggers and exacerbates asthma. And so that really grew my interest in environmental health. And so um, taking all of my experience experiences and passions and interests um, really helped me fine tune what my goal was for this fellowship. Um, so just wanted to encourage people thinking about it, you know, really think about all of all of your background, like, like the other presenters uh, talked about, and, um, and how do you bring that together to, uh, to focus on a project. So I uh, was focusing, decided to focus on health literacy and awareness of air quality 
in the Denver metro area. I'm in uh, North Denver, which is um, within about five miles of the only oil refinery in Colorado. And um, so I, uh, my goal was to do at least three educational sessions. And again, taking, taking my background, I started reaching out to different community-based organizations and um, landed on working with Moms Clean Air Force. They, they work with moms and others uh, to fight for clean air and a stable climate. And they, in Colorado and probably around the nation, they just have a really strong um, history of partnerships with other community-based organizations. So, um, so I'll kind of give you a little bit of a timeline in my, um, my work with them. So last summer, July of 2022, uh, I volunteered at an eco fiesta that they did up by the oil refinery. And um, it was a great way to start meeting a lot of the environmental justice activists in, um, in the area. And, uh, and a great way to just, uh, again, build relationships and, um, and be present. And so the, uh, they also asked if I would do, I was a speaker for a webinar that they did, uh, The Truth About Ozone. We have a, a big problem with um, ozone here in the Denver metro area. So um, I was able to do that last July. Let's see, sorry about that. Um, so in September, they partner, one of their partners, Moms Clean Air Force, is Black Parents United Foundation. And um, so they wanted to do an open house on asthma and um, talking about the environmental impacts um, on asthma. And uh, so I was uh, able to do a presentation for them um, on a Sunday afternoon. And uh, I believe that was. And also um, one of my beginning activities was sending a letter to the neighborhood newspaper. So highlighting what nurses, nurses do in the climate change space and um, highlighting also the Alliance of Nurses for Healthy Environments and the fellowship. Um, in October, it, it, really, it really worked out so beautifully. I just feel very fortunate and um, humbled that, that my work with the fellowship aligned with um, some funding that they had gotten around uh, doing an environmental justice community leadership training series. And so the first session of the training series, these are the women that um, organized it. And um, they, uh, I presented ar again around asthma and poor air quality in particular. Uh, in November, part of the fellowship is presenting to your um, healthcare peers. And so I was able to, I presented uh, two times at the state, the Colorado Association of School Nurses Conference. I uh, did a four hour pre-conference workshop and the whole thing wasn't on asthma and air quality, but I did a portion on, on that and then also on um, advocacy and community engagement and uh, my work with ANHE. And then um, also did a 60 minute breakout session during the conference to share the work. And um, over uh, December and January, I, um, it was pretty quiet, but again, in February, I attended the environmental justice uh, leadership training session for Black History. And um, I wasn't presenting, again, I, I believe some other presenters have talked about kind of showing up and, and that uh, is building those relationships and building that trust by, by being present and um, learning from others. And so that was a great opportunity to do that and a really fun celebration. And um, in March through May, I participated on a smaller group with Black Parents United Foundation. They um, were creating a community-led policy around air toxins and asthma. And so, um, so I you know, showed up at the committee meetings and, and helped give feedback and um, we submitted our draft a proposal to the state health department in June. And so, so June and beyond, uh, 
it was really fun. I volunteered again this uh, July at the Eco Fiesta and um, at the Moms Clean Our Forest booth and just um, continuing those relationships and continuing to, to be available when I, when I can. Um, I started the fellowship as a school nurse and um, as I, one or two other people have talked about, I ended up, um, because of my previous experiences and this fellowship really, um, I am now the program director for health at the National Environmental Education Foundation. So it, um, it really kind of um, led to a new uh, employment opportunity, which I'm really thankful for and um, love working with them. Um, and just, yeah, it was a very fun experience. I, th I think this is my last slide, yeah. I just, I wanted to agree with, uh, with everyone's thoughts about lessons learned and just the, you know, going into the experience with humility and curiosity and uh, uh, a spirit of partnership and support. And um, just, I just feel so, so blessed and so um, uh, edified by, by my relationships and experiences. So thanks again for being here and listening. Thank you, Christy. Let's show some love to Christy. Show some something in the chat. Uh, all right, yes, what an amazing journey. Uh, and so proud of all the presenters for the work that they've done or still doing, the ways that they've grown. Um, before we jump into the Q&A portion, I did wanna talk a little bit more about what the fellowship entails. And so I'm gonna pull a slide up. And you'll recognize this as the slide that we kind of started with, talking about you know what the nurses do as a part of this program. And so yes, they conduct projects, as you heard everybody talk about. But in addition to those projects, um, nurse fellows also participate in scheduled fellowship webinars, and these are basically skill building sessions to help prepare the fellows for their partnership with their CBOs. Um, we've done trainings on mapping tools, kind of like the one that Kayla showed you at the beginning of her presentation. We've done trainings on environmental racism and the legacy uh, of environmental racist policies on communities of color. We've done trainings on fundraising, uh, lobbying, uh, it's just a lot. And the idea here is we want to support you in your work with community so that you're not going in there blind. We want to build your skills up so you know how to be a support because uh, we we have a very strong policy around not going in with the savior mentality, not going in with the I know what your community needs mentality, but going in with the you live here, so you're the expert, how can I help? Uh, and those calls in the big monthly, Although some months we didn't have a call, for example, December, we didn't have a call. Um, and that kind of goes, we'll, we'll talk about it for those who get into the program. We also um, pair each nurse with a mentor uh, who helps support them in a myriad of ways, one with their connections, uh, one with like one-on-one -on -one support, although sometimes the, the mentors do uh, meetings with their three fellows. Each mentor gets three fellows and they'll do a meeting where they all talk about, hey, how's your project going? And we found that really helped because you get to hear about how someone else is doing and how that applies to your own program or give you some ideas of how to reach out. One thing that Matt did not mention is that uh, it was a little bit of a struggle at first to find his organization. And so in the beginning, Matt was literally driving two organizations and knocking on doors because folks were not <laughs> responding to emails. And sometimes some of those ideas like, go, go over there in person, come from your mentor. Um, and then uh, Chrissy talked on this one, each fellow in the second half of the fellowship program, although maybe the first thing was happening, will hold two educational sessions um, with, fellow health professionals. And the idea here is you're gonna share what you've been learning through your partnership with community with other health practitioners. What we wanna see happen throughout this program 
is closing the distance between community and care. So that folks learn, okay, yes, I can, I work for this hospital or this institution, but we work in service of this community. So how can we be a better service in terms of helping to improve the health outcomes of these, the communities that we're in? And so we wanna share that knowledge um, beyond. And then there's like a launch convening we have at the very beginning of the program, and then a closing convening that wraps the program up. And so the, the launch convening for this particular fellowship is the 27th through 29th of September. And then the ending one will probably happen sometime in August, 2024, maybe even September, 2024. We haven't landed on that date yet, um, but yes. So I think that opens us up for our Q&A. Uh, and let's see, let's go to the top. I think someone had a question for you, Matt. And the question was, if you could talk about your journey uh, into becoming a commissioned officer with NIH. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, a whole long other conversation. Um, I reached out to the uh, participant and when we're going to communicate over email, but the long and the short of it is, is that it was a long process to get commissioned, but it's totally worth it. And I feel like I am in a career, not just a job. Awesome. Well, I'm glad, I'm glad you reached out. Because <laughs> I bet you're right. It's probably a very long conversation. Uh, another question for you, Matt. How did you balance the fellowship with your school commitments? And did you find it manageable? Well, that was something I, I actually created. I, I'm nerdy in the sense that when I was applying or considering my application, I created a pros and cons spreadsheet, <laughs> just a little table. And uh, another Annie member who um, is a mentor of mine and, and I, um, she ended up writing a, a letter of recommendation for me. I got on the phone with her and shared this list with her. And I said, these are the pros, these are the cons. The pros outweigh the cons, but I'm a student, <laughs> I'm an officer, I have NIH responsibilities, I'm running this farm on the weekends. Like, am I crazy? Like, can I do this? <laughs> and she said, you know, like if this is if this is what you want to do, this is a great opportunity. Um, see if you can make it manageable. And there were so many things that were happening that was really. It was really beautiful. Um, Jeremiah mentioned these sessions we had, these educational um, sessions that were monthly. Um, one of them was on plastics and uh, a speaker came and talked about uh, her work in, from her organization, and, um, PFOS and PFOAs. And I had just had similar coursework. And so to go from the academic, you know, course lectures on it to hear someone who works in that environment and is describing what she does at, at the community level. It was like, and then another quick example is my DRPH work, uh, coursework was, uh, I took a communications class and literally the next week I was giving my presentation to um, nurses at, at NIH. So I used a lot of the skills of building a, a strong PowerPoint and uh, you know how, how to make a, a good uh, presentation. So it, it all it all works out. There were times that I was super stressed, yes, but you can do it. Yes, Anna, when there's a will, there is a way. That is facts. Um providing the location of the convenings. So yes, Kara answered it. Um, but I would also just add that for the convenings, uh, Annie pays for travel and lodging. And so all you really need to do is clear the space <laughs> in your in your calendar and, and show up. I think we had a fantastic time um, for our end of year convening for cohort two. Our launch convening had to be virtual because we were still kind of in the midst of lockdown and COVID. Um, but this particular cohort we'll get to do two in person, which I think is very special. So 
as as Matt and everybody says, we highly encourage you to apply. Um, do we have any other questions for our presenters? Jeremiah, could I just add something uh, while we're, people are gathering their thoughts some more? I just wanted to say that um, part of why I went into, wanted to do the fellowship is that I wanted to be, I wanted to grow and push myself in the area of advocacy. And, um, and so, so don't feel like you have to have everything figured out and you're already strong and everything, you know, it, it can be a really uh, great opportunity for growth. I mean, I had some pieces, but it really helped me grow in that area that, um, that I'm not sure I would have grown on my own. You know, I, I, it was great to have the fellowship and the cohort to kind of push and uh, push me in that direction. So, so just wanted to encourage everyone that uh, you don't need to have a uh, have it all figured out going into the fellowship that it's just a great um, safe community for growth. Yes, fantastic points. Um, yes, any any questions? Folks want to jump off a of, off a of mute and verbally ask your questions. It's totally fine. Uh, this is Mary Lee Pekeser. I'm real curious about how much time per week, and I know that's probably hard to answer, but if uh, it would help to, it would help me to know how much time you spent. And uh, it doesn't matter who answers that one. I can start. Um, it did depend on the week. I would say there was probably about half a day where I committed to you know, collectively over the week that I committed to communications. Um, and I, there were, but there were weeks when the project was really taking off where I may have met with the community-based organization an hour or two per week. Um, so maybe we were starting something on Monday, we met for an hour via Zoom, and then we met in person later another hour. Um, I was also in school at the same time. I worked full time. I was in school and I was doing the fellowship. And I would say, you know, I was I was able to balance because a lot of the community work was happening kind of after hours. So that allowed me to do that off cycle. But um, the commitment to the the community based organization is going to vary so much. So maybe having an idea of who you would be working with and the and the type of project. I still, I still found it manageable with all of those commitments, so. Thanks. I would say for myself, it was anywhere from uh, four to uh, eight, eight hours, which may have included a whole day when we were uh, out with the uh, organization and in, in promoting, uh, giving out information and gathering information. Uh, we also attended a youth summit uh, where all the uh, schools came together. So we uh, just uh, in recruiting and, and trying to gather the information. I would say for me, it, it, it varied from two to eight hours uh, uh, per week. Uh, and most of the time we're trying to catch, play catch up. Uh, sometimes it went over. So it really depends on your own work schedule, what you have to do. Uh, I am invested in a lot of community activities. So in some parts, I was able to um, combine some of the activities with um, the organizations that I was already involved with, uh, trying to connect the dots as well. Yeah, and I would add, you know, it really comes down to your project. For instance, we had a nurse up in Boston who was working with the collective of organizations. And for her project, every quarter she was uh, moderating a uh, community call with like 100 plus community members that had some speakers. And so she was facilitating this, and all of them were on public health topics. And so the month when that call happened, there was more time in terms of obligated nation to the event. But the months where it wasn't happening, it was maybe like one call every other week. 
because there was space before the actual event. So if your project is like event based, the month of the event will probably be more time than the months leading up to. Uh, we got an application question. I'm trying to know my focus on who to ask for a letter of recommendation. Are there specific guidelines around this? Um, no, there's not. I think having folks who understand either A, your passion for environmental health or who know you from work experience in terms of your public health background would probably be the strongest people to ask for recommendations from. Um, but there aren't any specific guidelines around it. And I'll just add to the letter of recommendations. We have put that as optional, and that is because we received feedback that that was preventing people from applying within that kind of quick turnaround application. And when we say optional, we really do mean that. We don't want that to hold up your application if you're really interested in applying. Um, it doesn't give you a leg up if you have letters of recommendation. We we look at everyone's equally with or without them. Um, but you know, if if you have folks that are willing to to write those and you have access to those people, we encourage you to include them. Exactly that. Awesome. Mm -hmm. um, any other questions? These are good questions. Yes, I can share the application link. I'll share the application link first, and then I'm actually going to share some other links as well. So if you're like, I'm ready to apply right now, then all you got to do is, <laughs> is, click, is click this, and then you're good. But if you want to, to, to learn more about the fellowship, we actually just launched a new website very recently. Uh, we finished editing it last month, so we, we launched it this month. Like on the first. So you can go on this website, you can look up uh, bios and such from cohort one, bios and such from cohort two. Uh, there's a little bit about the fellowship, some of the slides that I covered in terms of what components go into the fellowship. And I also talked about the, the four principles of the fellowship. So it's a really broad background um, into what the fellowship entails. And then if you go to this particular page, it talks everything of application or everything about how to apply, what the, what the eligibility requirements are, uh, expectations of the program and so forth. And on that page, you'll also find the Google form for submitting your application. And so highly encourage you, if you're still like, am I qualified? Click, <laughs> click it and read, because I would argue if you're on this call, you are qualified. And I'll just read the eligibility criteria. One, have at least one year of nursing. <laughs> so that's probably everybody on this call. Uh, two, an active nursing li license. <laughs> Three, an expressed interest in environmental health nursing. And then four, demonstrate a commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Because one thing that will really become apparent to you very shortly after joining this program is that there is a correlation between negative environmental health factors and unfortunately the communities that have been most impacted. I have a question that um, I think a lot of fellows in the first and second cohort might have had along the way that might be helpful. Can someone talk about the support uh, about finding a community-based organization to partner with and getting a project going and what if it's taking forever and we're, you know, months into the fellowship and I still haven't found my organization. And then, you know, even if it's long enough, talk about the continued support with, by Annie if, if it's not happening on the exact timeline of the fellowship. I could take that one. <laughs> um, did I hear somebody else? 
Uh, so, so yeah, um, Jeremiah mentioned earlier, it did take me longer than I expected. Uh, so I didn't really identify PASA. Our, our timeline was different. We started last summer. Uh, so what was it? Ju June, I believe, right? So by August, I was getting nervous. By September, I was like asking for help because there was a, two organizations I was thinking about. Um, one of them was uh, in Manchester, Maryland. And I felt like they would be a good fit because I could, I passed by them all the time on the road. Um, their hours were really limited and it was a small, small group. Um, but my mentor really got me to think about what is that organization's future and goals and how, how can you be of service to them and how can they be of service to you? Um, and I, I kind of rethought things and I'm glad that I waited and uh, took the time to really identify PASA as a group because um, I'm hoping to be invited, I applied, but hoping to be invited to be a speaker on a, on a panel in their conference um, next February, like I mentioned, but also uh, they have so many connections to all these other farming and agriculture and food system uh, groups that I need to know about uh, for my for my career. So, um, you know, it, it was definitely worth it to wait. And, and to your point, Hannah, um, not only my mentor, um, Chris, but any staff were checking in with me. I had phone calls, like helping me realize like, it's okay, Matt, you're, you're not alone. There are other fellows that are struggling and it's not the end of the world, um, which is in part why I've continued to work with PASA because I started a little later with them, but um, the work is so meaningful that I didn't want to just say goodbye at the end of the fellowship. You know? Hmm. I think I would add to that also, you know, I had identified my community-based organization really before I started the fellowship. However, we didn't identify a project. Um, and when we did identify the project, it became clear pretty late, uh, like earlier this year, that we weren't going to complete the project. And so that was when my mentor was helpful to, to help me say, you know, this is a long-term relationship. So is there part of the project you have finished that you, you can use to report on? And then the continuation of your project is the sustainability piece. So in my case, we had this plan to do this action plan with all these testimonials, but we ended up saying, okay, well, we've completed the assessment. That's a big piece of it. So let's report on that as our, our part and then report on the sustainability being complete, you know, the, the implementation of the program. So you may have to pivot in that way throughout. And I would say never did I feel like the Annie staff or, or Jeremiah or anyone was like, why haven't you done this? You know, it was, it, they're so flexible. They're so, uh, they're so much grace and so much support. So, you know, while there are deadlines, it's all under the, with the understanding that you're working with communities who have their own needs and emergencies and timelines, so. For me, it was um, uh, pretty easy to uh, choose the CBO. Uh, as I had mentioned before, that I had begun with the group in 2011 and kind of dropped off out of the loop. And I had some other groups, uh, the Community Air Monitoring Network, and also the work that the state was doing for childhood lead poisoning, uh, the advisory committee. So I had some, some options, but um, because uh, the Delaware uh, residents' concern for the environment was uh, something that I had kind of uh, fallen off the wagon I wanted to reconnect and uh, as it was statewide, uh, I thought it was um, uh, pertinent because the groups that I were working with in the other organizations, it was again like connecting the dots, letting one hand know what the other hand was doing and how can we help one another? 
as opposed to working in silos. And one thing I would also add is, you know, if you are someone who's on this call, who's done some volunteer work with a group and kind of done the, the route that Kayla did, which is already have some element of a relationship with a group, then chances are it'll be a lot easier for you to uh, reach out and establish a partnership. If you're someone who's starting cold, don't fret. You know, we're going to be your support in, in, in building that bridge, as will your mentor. Um, and a lot of the fellows, actually most of the fellows came in without a relationship to an organization. And by the time they finished their fellowship, they had one. And so even if you're not currently involved, it's still possible. I would add to Jeremiah that uh, even though um, I was coming into the, the group after so many years, it was still um, uh, really important that the uh, group knew that I, I had asked their their uh, approval <coughs> to join the, rejoin the group uh, because I didn't want to seem it to seem that I was using them in any any uh, form or fashion. And so there was some resistance, uh, again, uh, gain, regaining the trust of the group and the individuals because some of the newcomers didn't know me or my, or my background. And so it was uh, a period of getting to know you all over again and uh, identifying, well, just how can I help? Uh, what do you want me to do? And it was the group uh, that came up with the idea that it would be helpful to them if they had a di directory of organizations that were involved in environmental and climate justice. So th there, there, you might run into some resistance at first, and it's difficult not to seem like um, being the eldest of 11 children, I'm kind of, you got to do something or get off the pot type of person. And so I was really had to kind of control my, not to be aggressive, uh, but certainly to be assertive. Yes, thank you for that, Lana. Um, We got a few minutes left. Are there any questions, comments folks still have? No, all right. If not, we will make this recording available to you all. Uh, Zoom's got to bounce it and all that jazz. Uh, and then, oh, Kara just dropped something in the chat. We'll send out a follow-up email to those that registered. For those that would like to receive nursing continued education, please complete this evaluation to receive your certificate. So if you would like to get some continued education credits, please click that link um, so that you can receive those credits. Uh, thank you all so much for making time on this Wednesday afternoon, and we are very much looking forward to receiving some applications from you all uh, for the fellowship and for cohort three. So thank you all and have a good rest of your night. Yes. If you have any questions for any particular presenter, feel free to reach out to me and I'll get that to them and I can connect you. Karen, is that a question about how many applicants received and accepted? Ooh, well, we had 24 accepted. I think we received about 49 last time. Hey, great. Awesome. Thank All right. you. Great session. Great work, everybody. Thanks. Yes. And yes, we have 18 spots for this cohort. Great, great call, Karen. All right, everyone. Take care. Thank you for joining. Great job, presenters. Woo-woo!